NerdErotic.com. Greetings, you over one million Awakening Wonders. Thank you very much. You know, there are warnings as old as time. Don't talk about politics at the dinner table. Look both ways before you cross the street. Don't run with scissors. Don't drive drunk. Don't date a woke white woman. And our good friends at Hollywood have ignored the equivalent of all of those. Don't hire activists. Don't go on strike to hasten an industry contraction. Don't make the paying customer your enemy. Don't buy billion dollar intellectual properties with built in fandoms and then piss off those fandoms immediately by subverting their favorite characters. Lord Vader, prepare to meet your maker. But at least for now, it looks like the eight year Hollywood Wokane bender has finally come to an end. Dad, who recently transitioned from mom, has bailed it out of jail and it's on its way to a swanky Malibu rehab. And in this analogy, while woke Hollywood is going over the error of its ways, its friends, the gaming industry and Eastern entertainment are moving in on its girlfriend, the market share. Something that Eastern entertainment in particular was able to take advantage of because the woke attic Hollywood decided not to work for a half a year. And now the results are in. Hollywood contraction hits entertainment executive jobs. Quote, this is a full scale depression, unquote. Oh no. Anyway, last week. From deadline for Hollywood, Q1 was a bust. Will CinemaCon bring Q2 hope? Uh, spoilers, no, but I may be at CinemaCon. Can't wait to meet Movie Bob. Now, often when I go over these navel-gazing access media articles, while they make some good points, I have to fill in the blanks, like Hollywood and entertainment is being murdered by the message, but there's something different about this one. All due respect to Godzilla, but the first quarter of this year was a bust for Hollywood. There's no getting around it. The news read like an April Fool's joke without a punchline. To be fair, I don't know if April Fool's Day is necessary anymore, especially here in Western civilization. Every day is April Fool's Day, especially in Hollywood and entertainment, and I'll give you an example of that later. Disney gave up its fight with Florida, better to face its battle with investor Nelson Peltz. Paramount's global debt is down to junk, and Paramount Plus is weirdly removing some of its hotter kids titles from the streaming mix. Just some speculation here, maybe Paramount Plus is starting to distance themselves from certain Nickelodeon shows over a certain documentary. Ah, uh, yes, that was poorly handled. AMC is scratching for cash and peddling stock. The Alamo Draft House chain is for sale, and that actually sucks because I like the Alamo Draft House. At the box office, Q1's big hit was part two of a reimagining of a science fiction novel that ran hot when I was in the eighth grade. Well, we must be around the same age. In other words, a long time ago. Through the weekend, Doom Part 2 had about $252 million in domestic ticket sales, which helped drag the overall box office total to around $1.6 billion, with a boost from the strong last-minute performance by Godzilla x Kong, The New Empire. Watching that was the cinematic equivalent of a 54-year-old eating a happy meal. Brief enjoyment leading to inevitable regret. The total is only down about 6.4% from last year's first quarter, but it's still off 45% from the glory years like 2017 and 2018. And what's really sad is this article doesn't even mention Ghostbusters Frozen Empire, and I have to agree with Jeremy Johns, a better title would have been Ghostbusters Afterthought, which underperformed its first weekend and then fell off a cliff its second. For the record, Doom Part 2 would have placed fourth in 2016, different times, behind Deadpool, Star Wars The Last Jedi, the movie that truly started this downward spiral, and the furry's favorite Zootopia. In the Q one standings as tallied by boxofficemojo.com. Thus have expectations fallen. The first quarter box office, in fact, roughly matches what it was in the year 2000, and that's without adjusting for inflation. Now the article states, keen observers, of course, saw the current movie slump coming. Sure, if you had at least one functioning eye and an above room temperature IQ, which would exclude most of Hollywood, as the number of planned releases fell in the wake of last year's Hollywood strikes, yet they went on strike anyway. Now Deadline asks, what can be done about it? That would have been a really good question in 2016, but apparently Hollywood is in need of a reboot. Now, I have been told in the past by some people that the titles of my videos can be a bit hyperbolic at times. For example, Disney is in full panic mode, but this next paragraph really exemplifies their desperation and shows 
that Hollywood is in full panic mode. Maybe some answers will actually surface next week in Las Vegas when theater owners meet for their annual CinemaCon convention. Granted, Caesars Palace isn't normally where you'd turn for deep soul-searching and strategic vision, but the great industry reboot has to start somewhere. Bit of a shocker coming from Deadline, who, along with all of their other ilk in the access media, had been reporting that everything was fine until recently. But they do talk about the need to diversify, create some variety, because quite frankly, in the big budget films we've gotten over the last four or five years, particularly from Disney, there hasn't been. And then they bring up finding strength in the middle by backing modestly budgeted movies like The Holdovers and Megan or Godzilla Minus One, although that's not from Hollywood. And then they bring up Angel Studios and don't put it in the negative light. What? Or given that Sony is sitting out CinemaCon, which should tell you how important CinemaCon is to the industry, it might be worth listening to the Angel Studios presentation on Wednesday, April 10th. The people who brought you The Sound of Freedom. You know, the movie that the entire mainstream media was coming down on, calling it the Anon of Q. You know, the film that exposes trafficking children. Angel Studios might patch some holes in the schedule or have a useful thought about the alternative audience, which has grown thanks to Hollywood's act over the last almost decade. But this last paragraph is the kicker. That certainly beats counting on Hollywood's corporate types who have bigger problems than movies right now or looking towards the stars, many of whom who'd rather talk politics than promote films. Did I just read that? Did Deadline just call out movie stars for being insufferable twats? If you're looking for a sign of things possibly changing far too late, that was it. Or waiting for Despicable Me 4, which might or might not jumpstart things come the middle of Q2. That's how bad things are. Again, that's just theatrical. We haven't even talked about the streaming bubble, which has burst. But the main thing driving the Hollywood market has been franchises. And not just any franchises, old franchises that they've completely destroyed and their time has come and gone. And we're well into the apathy phase, something Bob Iger is finding out after overseeing the destruction of Star Wars and Marvel. And in the what have you done for me lately, Hollywood, Disney Star Wars, which I believe has never been good, but I'll be fair and say it hasn't been good for about seven or eight years. And Disney Marvel hasn't been good for five. And poor old Bobby's even lost his allies in the access media from the Hollywood Reporter. Bob Iger's invincible era is over. After a major Wall Street firm sides with activist Nelson and Pelts, who was fighting the activist Disney company, ahead of an April 3rd shareholders meeting, investors are questioning how the CEO plans to plot out growth and his own succession, probably by buying more shit. And now even the media is wondering if the guy's gonna leave in 2026 like he promised. No matter what happens with the shareholder vote, the weatherman will still have his job, but it will be an indictment on his entire legacy, which will matter to him a lot. And considering what Disney Marvel and Disney Star Wars has put out or announced over the last six months, the Marvels, Echo, our Charmin obeyed Shinoi Ray movie, and the Acolyte, I would like to point out, it wasn't meant with rage, it was meant with laughter. And very soon, it won't even be met with that. If you want a good example of two franchises that are well past the anyone giving a fuck phase, look no further than Star Trek and Doctor Who. Both shows have a lot in common. They're either at or approaching being 60 years old. Doctor Who is well past being a decade since it was good and Star Trek is approaching too. Both franchises had their continuity that was built over decades by some pretty brilliant men and women completely destroyed by hack activist soap opera writers. Both franchises sacrificed their male characters on the altar of agenda all to promote insufferable female replacements. Both shows gave us pronouns in space. She's pretty fast. They're fast. Um, they? Not, not she. I've never felt like a she or, or a her. So I would prefer they or them. You're assuming he as a pronoun. True. Yes, sorry, good point. Are you he or she? Will they get out of my face, clown? All leading to diminishing returns, and when it was all said and done, both franchises were completely spent. Then, with both franchises, there was a glimmer of hope. With Star Trek, there was Terry Metalis's Picard Season 3, which was immediately squandered when Alex Kurtzman decided to not pick up Legacy. With Doctor Who, it was the return of Russell T. Davies, David Tennant, and Catherine Tate for some specials. 
But unfortunately, instead of getting TV showrunner Russell T. Davies, we got activist Russell T. Davies, and it was immediately squandered. And now both franchises have series coming out in the next couple of months, and I doubt you even know. Or care. Star Trek Discovery, better known as STD, flares up one last time this month. And the once enigmatic and mysterious Doctor Who, hell, it's in the title, returns as the not-so-mysterious Doctor Gay in May. Correction, Disney's Doctor Who, and yes, that's another thing Iger had a hand in f***ing up. On March 27th, Variety put up this PR puff piece, probably directly from Paramount, the future of Star Trek from Starfleet Academy to new movies and Michelle Yao. How the 58-year-old franchise is planning for the next generation of fans. Sheer f***ing hubris. Just a few hours later, in The Hollywood Reporter, we get this. Paramount Global Debt Cut to Junk Status by S&P Global. And just days before Doctor Who released another cringe trailer and announced their episode titles for the upcoming season, Russell T. Davies said this. I think Doctor Who would have to become a co-production. There's no way the BBC is going to fund that. You've also got to look in the long term at the end of the BBC, which is somehow, surely, undoubtedly on its way in some shape or form. And after watching the abysmal Ghostbusters movie and Roadhouse back-to-back -back where the only redeeming thing was Conor McGregor's horrific acting. Oh, don't be like that. Here, I got a tip for you. Don't let no one get this close. Hollywood isn't just out of ideas, they're out of recycled ideas. And let's be real, most of these franchises weren't franchises at all. They were one film, some were maybe two, and most, if not all, were of their time. And the ones that were legitimate franchises that could have lasted forever, unfortunately won't. Their best days are far behind them. Partially, if not mostly, due to incompetent hacks writing different variations of the sad old legacy character teamed up with a girl boss who, by the end of the film, shows him the error of his ways, teaches him how to live, laugh, and love right before he dies. Um, well, I'm surrounded by... Idiots. <laughs> no. Yeah, I'd create a bankruptcy and corporatism to the mix, and that's a recipe for disaster. But hey, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm blowing things out of proportion. Let's take a look at the remaining release list for 2024, which features 17 variations of prequels, sequels, and reboots. Of course, we know about Deadpool 3 and Joker 2, but here's the rest. Furiosa, a Mad Max saga without Mad Max. Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, the fourth film in the third reboot of that franchise. Bad Boys 4, Inside Out 2, A Quiet Place Day 1, Despicable Me 4, Twisters, which is the sequel to Twister, Alien Romulus, which takes place between Alien and Aliens, making it Alien 1 and a half. A Beetlejuice sequel, a Transformers prequel, Venom 3, Gladiator 2, The Karate Kid, which is a sequel to The Karate Kid, which was a reboot to the original, featuring some people from the original, not to be confused with the final season of Cobra Kai. Mufasa, a live-action prequel to the live-action remake of The Lion King. This is fine. I'm okay with the events that are unfolding currently. If you like what you heard, please like, share, and subscribe. If you didn't like what you heard, I thank you for listening this long. I will see you in the next video. Nerderotic.com, please subscribe.